Hello, um, and welcome to the Westberger The Lara Side. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. This has been great. Yeah, all right. So just to start us off really quick, um, while of course this doesn't apply to all sick Americans, but the vast majority of sick Americans were, were an immigrant community. Mm -hmm. So I know that's something you can also relate to. How did being the child of someone considered the first of their race in their field impact mm -hmm. your perspective growing up? Huge imprint. Yeah. Uh, you know, hard to hard to overstate it. Um, you know, and, and, and in many ways, uh, at, of course, it has made me much more cognizant, right, of the contributions of immigrant communities um, to our Commonwealth. I'll, I'll I'll dive right in and tell you something that you know has been hard for me recently, um, and the way that I carry my father's experience and his contributions into that is. Um, Recently, uh, in the state house, the uh, House of Representatives and soon the Senate will be um, taking up and voting on legislation to uh, allow driver's licenses yeah. for uh, all residents of the state who, you know, otherwise qualify, even if they don't have uh, federal, do you know, documentation, uh, immigration documentation. And there was a tweet that somebody, you know, put up online after I tweeted about, you know, being excited to take up this bill who said something, you know, pretty hateful, something yeah. along the lines of, you know, you and your kind are ruining this commonwealth, went on to say, I hope you get hit by a, a car. But the worst of it actually for me was uh, the characterization of immigrants as ruining this commonwealth when I know yeah. full well the profound contributions uh, that immigrant communities of many kinds, right, over the decades have made to this uh, state and this country. You know, I, I think about my father who, um, came as a skinny brown kid and uh, very little money <laughs> in his pocket, um, and you know that. But this incredible dream um, to become an astronaut, and many people along the way who said, you know, that'll never happen. And um, he has gone on to, you know, not only become the first Latino and first naturalized citizen astronaut, but he has he tied for the record for the most space flights in NASA's history. And he's founded a uh, rocket propulsion, tech, you know, development company that employs, you know, dozens of people. Is advancing, you know, scientific knowledge for deep space exploration. These are massive contributions, yeah. right? Um, you know, and, and an incredible return on investment that this country made in him, um, you know, by making a higher education system that he could access, right, and embracing him and welcoming him as an immigrant. So that deeply informs my perspective on policy, you know, yeah. as I think about things that, like education policy and um, uh, driver's licenses. And it also influences me when I think about the challenges that I face, right? Running for governor, for example, like that looks tiny you know, <laughs> compared to the challenges that he surmounted to uh, become an astronaut. So it puts it in healthy perspective. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so how did your mother's work contribute to your career choice and also like your opinion on the general major issues? Deeply, deeply. And um, I, I so appreciate you asking about my mom's influence because my dad's story is often sort of, you know, told more. Um, but her um, career has been a profound influence on me. She's a social worker. Um, and growing up, I saw her uh, work in particular, especially with women and children who live on the margins of society and whose families, you know, hit up against the same barriers again and again and again. And watching that and watching her do that work of, of you know, care and systems navigation with these families, uh, you know, it, it made me as a young, it's deeply politicizing, you know, for me. And I kept thinking, there's got to be a better way to solve these problems that, pe that so many families share in common, right, rather than one by one. And that really, I think, pushed me to look at community organizing and public policy um, as as my career path, right, to try and find those more systemic solutions to those shared problems. Yeah. Okay, so education is a very, very important topic for SICKs everywhere. I mean, the word SICK itself really translates mm -hmm. to the word student, mm -hmm. and that's how we view our role in this life. Mm -hmm. Now, on that note, I know education is also a very important issue for you with the Student Opportunity Act mm -hmm. of 2019. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell us why this is such a big issue for you and how you plan to improve the Massachusetts educational system? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is a huge issue for me, of course, you know, on a personal level, right? I'm a former public school teacher. Yeah. I am also a parent of school-aged children, right? So I get this on multiple sides. Um, but also, uh, you know, aside from those personal intersections, 
there are very few, if any, uh, well, you know, sort of what we call silver bullets in public policy, right, that can solve everything with one fell swoop. So there are none of those, but education is the closest thing I yeah. think that we have, right? If we can get it right in our education system, we take a huge bite out of poverty, out of you know violence in our communities, um, out of you know we we build not a huge bite out, right? But we build up uh, sustaining our democracy, right? Mm -hmm. We think about the battles that we have right now in our politics over basic facts, right? Science. Um, so there are, the stakes are, are significant. Yeah. Um, and that's why education has always been a focus for me because it is ground zero for where we get so many things either right or wrong. Um, and the Student Opportunity Act, yeah. which I love that you mentioned, is like my third child. Um, <laughs> It is. It took you know five years. It was a five year battle. Uh, you know now it looks like it was you know it was easy and you know it was always victorious. But when we started out, it was not. And people said that's pie in the sky. That'll never happen. Um, that's unrealistic um, because it is a major shift in the way that we fund K through twelve public schools. There are huge gaps right between wealthy communities and poor communities and. Uh, white communities and communities of color for the most part in Massachusetts. And even though our you know, our averages are higher than most states in terms of educational attainment, if you peel back a layer of that and look under the hood, what you see is that we have some of the most vast gaps between have and have not communities and families in Massachusetts. And so the Student Opportunity Act works to bridge those gaps by making really significant investments, $1.5 billion right across the whole state, but most of that is concentrated in the communities of highest need. Yeah. So it really is gonna um, be a game changer in the way that we do the work of delivering K through 12 education and um, you know, close those gaps in our state. We gotta do that again now with early education and care and with higher education. Yeah. So Sikhism has selfless service as like one of the core tenets. So I was like really truly inspired when I read about your work during, during the housing crisis that was made mm -hmm. worse by COVID. Can you tell us how you plan to move forward with that? Mm, housing is um, one of uh, probably the most constant and, and, and repeated issue that I hear about, no matter what part of the state I'm in, right? Uh, Eastern Massachusetts, Greater Boston, right? Uh, the district that I currently represent, I knew this was an intensive issue, but I hear really deep anxiety about housing from you know, Springfield to um, the Cape and the islands, uh, you know, north, south, east, west, everywhere. So. Um, even once we get through this pandemic, right, those pains are not going to go away because they didn't start with the pandemic. Um, we've got, you know, young people, right, who can't afford to buy into the communities where they grew up. Um, part of that's to do with housing. Part of that's to do with student debt load that you're carrying. Um, we've got uh, police and firefighters, carpenters who can't afford to live in the communities that they serve, right? Even just, you know, one of the Westboro police officers that was here, you know, he mentioned he grew up in Westboro but does not live here now. Um, so this is an issue we've got to get our hands around. Uh, that is going to involve multiple things, right? We have to walk and chew gum. Um, we probably don't have enough time here to go through you know, the whole housing policy plan, but it is going to involve things like um, zoning reform to make sure that all communities in Massachusetts are sharing in the responsibility of building affordable housing. Um, it's going to be mean funding, right? We need to put a more significant and dependable investment into building affordable housing. It means transportation policy also, right? B building out our mass transit systems so that we're expanding the places in Massachusetts where people can live and still get to and from their jobs um, and enlivening local economies more with that transportation infrastructure so that uh, people can you know, work closer to home. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, but there's another big problem that was certainly existed before COVID, but was exacerbated mm -hmm. by the pandemic, and that was the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So COVID, there's a new strain, and the possibility of another wave cannot mm -hmm. be denied. Mm -hmm. So with all of that happening, COVID has certainly impacted lower income communities mm -hmm. and racial minorities much more mm -hmm. and putting them at higher risk of contracting and mm -hmm. thus dying of the disease. Mm -hmm. How do you plan on dis addressing this disparity when it comes to vaccine hesitancy, treatment, access, and more? Yeah. Um, I'm so glad you called that out, Karen. You know, it's important that we keep naming it, yeah. right? Especially as we, uh, you know, sort of enter into this next phase, right, of the pandemic where 
the sort of constant attention level is going down. Mm-hmm. Um, part of it is about continuing to measure, right? Who is um, bearing the brunt of infections, hospitalizations, deaths, right? Because you cannot manage what you don't measure. Yeah. We were talking about this a little bit earlier with respect to hate crimes, right? If you don't even count, right, who is um, on the receiving end of hate crimes, you, you don't really understand the, the nature of the problem. Um, this was something that I pushed for early in the pandemic was just to have robust and transparent data collection about who is suffering from COVID. Um, so we need to keep up those data systems. And that doesn't happen by itself, unfortunately. That takes constant you know, watchdogging. And then you know, we have to keep our foot on the gas in terms of zeroing in on those disparities, right? whether it's yeah. vaccination disparities, health disparities, economic disparities. I worry about COVID becoming another um, diabetes or another asthma, right? Where it's a chronic, it just sort of, it's chronically with us and people kind of get used to, well, those are disparities that have always been there and they'll always exist. And we kind of just look away, right? Um, so we have to you know, keep that sense of urgency, that fire in the belly about, we're not gonna accept this as normal. Uh, and we're not just gonna sort of go back to the pre-pandemic status quo where we let disparities like this you know, fade into the wallpaper um, while meanwhile, poor people, people of color, immigrant communities are carrying that load um, on their own. And that is you know, why it is so important for us to have folks in leadership roles in government who you know, are directly accountable to the communities that are carrying those loads um, so that those problems don't get forgotten about and they don't get you know, kind of swept under the rug. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, thank you. So Sikhism, like a lot of other religions, like really emphasizes the power of nature and the divinity of it. Mm-hmm. So in order to protect the environment in Massachusetts, what are your plans? Oh, so many. <laughs> um, we've got a full scale Green New Deal plan um, up on the campaign website. So folks can check it out right there at soniachangdiaz.com. Um, and, you know, it is incumbent upon us, of course, as stewards of our planet, right, of divine nature, um, to not screw it up. <laughs> um, but there's also incredible opportunity for us here in Massachusetts, right? We need to be urgent. We need to use every tool in our toolbox. We need to run toward solutions to avert the da- disasters of climate change and extreme weather events. You as young people know this better than most, right? But we also, we need to be urgent about making this transition to a fully green energy economy, because, not just to avert disaster, but also because there are huge economic opportunities that await us as a state if we just sort of have the vision and the, um, the follow through, right, to go out and grab them. And here again, we have to keep equity at the center and make sure that um, those tens of thousands of jobs that we can build in Massachusetts by building up our um, offshore wind um, capacity, solar panel um, developments, geothermal opportunities, um, conversions of you know our built environment to green energy. All of those things are going to create jobs and create wealth. And we need to make sure that low-income communities, immigrant communities who've been at the front of the line for the brunt of environmental degradation are also at the front of the line for those jobs and that wealth creation as we make this transition. But the plan that I've laid out on the website, we set some pretty um, specific um, benchmarks so that people can hold me accountable to those, right? Like making sure that we are meeting 100% of our electricity use in Massachusetts with green energy uh, by 2030, for example, or building, you know, expanding and electrifying our public transit systems. All right, so kind of transitioning back to that question of education, Mm -hmm. um, a lot of Sikhs in this country, like communities across the nation that are in the minority, Mm -hmm. experience um, discrimination based Mm -hmm. on their appearance or faith in Mm -hmm. general. Um, Now we found the best way to combat this is through the education Mm -hmm. about these minorities and for us that we're asking you, Mm -hmm. would you consider um, adding sick awareness to the Massachusetts educational curriculum? Mm -hmm. So we were just talking about this a little (laughs) little earlier. And in Massachusetts, we have um, both the sort of, um, I think the the pride, um, but also the um, friction of having a really decentralized education uh, sort of um, authority, right? We have 351 cities and towns. We have even more school districts than that. And every city and town and school district makes their own decisions about Mm -hmm. textbooks and exactly how they implement the curriculum. But what we do have at the state level 
is the curriculum frameworks, yeah. right? So it's this pretty broad set of, um, you know, the skeletal structure, right, of mm -hmm. the curriculum. And every few years, the state refreshes the curriculum framework. So I'm, I don't remember what year it's, you know, coming up yeah. next, but the social studies curriculum will be up for reconsideration. Um, and I think that's a great opportunity for the Sikh community, for allied organizations, for allied other you know, faith communities to come and really do a deep dive on the curriculum framework and say, you know, where are places in here that we can make sure that uh, you know, world religions are really, um, and you know, being the fifth largest world religion, yeah. right? That, that you're not left out of that um, curriculum. And that um, places where we do already have in the curriculum framework mention of um, educating young people about uh, perspectives different than their own. Right, and how do, how do we in a pluralistic society, um, you know, confront and embrace that? Right, those are things that are already actually in the curriculum framework. I know because I'm a social studies teacher, <laughs> but giving life to those in a more granular way, right? And and what are some examples where that specific faith communities uh, might experience historically and in our current events? Now, um, I know this is a very big question, mm -hmm. but. Sikhism itself is truly founded on this idea of equality for all people, no matter their race, caste, gender, mm -hmm. or any other factor of their identity. Mm -hmm. How do you plan on fighting for the equality of all Massachusetts residents? Yeah. Yeah. It's such a good question. It is a big question, but it's an important one to ask. So I will say um, what I have seen here today at the Gurdwara is an example of what you, what I will do as governor, right? Which is in every, you know, in every way, since I walked in the front door, what I can see is the sense of pride, right, in that value um, that the Sikh community has. And it has, you know, it permeates the way that you talk to one another, the way that you're structuring your classes, um, the way that, you know, the worship uh, service is structured. And that's what you should expect from government as well, right, that it permeates everything that we do. Uh, for me, it will start day one by appointing people to you know, my cabinet and major positions uh, of power within the executive agencies that represent the full breadth um, and beauty and diversity of our state, whether that's uh, diversity of faith, diversity of expertise, diver you know, racial and ethnic background, gender. Um, and it has to be, you have to have that diversity at the tables where decisions are actually made and not just in a you know, advisory table yeah. over here. Um, you should also expect to see it from me in, you know, hard-nosed policy, right, and in budgeting decisions where we put our resources. Th th those are values decisions. Um, in our public safety policy, in our education policy, right, fighting to close those opportunity gaps. Um, in our environmental and our climate policy. Um, and then you can also expect to see me as a governor use my use the bully pulpit of the governor's office to stand up and speak these values um, in the public square. Um, both in a uh, you know preventive way, in a positive building way, um, but also when it's needed, you know, to help uh, heal and grieve together. When we, as a Commonwealth, experience um, incidences of discrimination, uh, hate speech, violence, you know, it is an important part of the, the responsibility, especially of our chief executive, um, to give voice and you know speak those truths and not sweep them under the rug. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for speaking with us today. Um, thank you for coming to the Gurdwara. It was a pleasure talking to you. Likewise. Thank you, guys. Yeah.